obviously a lot to go on and share with you. It's uh, just, a, just a couple of announcements. As you came in the, same, in the church, you saw in the foyer, uh, the baby bottle boomerang table is set out in the foyer. Yeah, it is. Usually a snowy season. But um, we want to encourage you to take a bottle and fill that bottle with cash, money, a check. You know, many times in the Christian world, we make statements that we're anti-abortion. We stand against abortion because we believe in the right of life, that all life is valuable. Here's our opportunity. We give support to the uh, Pregnancy Resource Center in Athens, Ohio. And uh, we give support to them, financial support, as they reach out and talk to young women who are looking for an answer, looking for an alternative looking for a support system we want to be a part of that support system to save the life of a baby and so we've contributed over the years and helped them also purchase a sonogram machine ultrasound machine so that many times when a young woman sees the life that's in her she'll change her mind and so we need to pray because with abortion the woman suffers She's a victim, and so is, so is the child. So if you get a chance before you leave today, grab a bottle, sign up the list, put your name down, bring it back in a couple of weeks, the bottle, and fill with money, and, or with a check if you just want to write a check. God will bless you for it. So I want to make mention of that. Also, God's Hands at Work Outreach we do uh, for the Community Food Pantry that uh, if you put that tile up there for God's hands at work, that uh, we have a project for January and February, personal care products. So you see on the list there what you can bring. It will be much appreciated if you bring those items in. It helps people who have trouble buying groceries or in bad uh, financial condition or in great need. And we're able to support them and reach out to them. We are continuing having Wednesday night connect groups at 7 p.m. And uh, on Wednesday nights, a kid men group, pre-teen group, teen men group, and adult class here in the sanctuary. Last Wednesday, we just had a great time talking and sharing a continuance of what I preach on Sunday. We continue more on Wednesday night, maybe looking at in deeper ways and different angles. So I want to encourage you to come Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. And also we have prayer on Thursday evenings, 5 to 7, here in the sanctuary. The lights will be down. You can come in at any time and come and find a place to pray. And the Lord will bless you as you seek the face of God. Isn't God so good and faithful to each and every one of us? And also I want to thank you for your financial giving. Would you stand with me and worship team if you'll come on up? Right here. Right here. Deal put up about the financial giving. There's ways to give, and you can see on the screen the different ways. I want to encourage you to give, and God will bless you as you give. Give offerings, we have the offering boxes in the back wall, and also a timely app, and give online. The Lord will bless you for it. This is a season where we believe God and know God is, is doing great things in our lives. And my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Now that's my God. How about your God? Uh -huh. He's faithful, isn't he? He's great. And right now I want you just to go, if you would, just lift your hands toward heaven and worship. That means surrender. We're talking about all in. So we raise our hands toward heaven and say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender I'm all in. I give you praise and glory. Lord, we worship you at this time, God, as we go into worship. Just anoint everything that takes place, God. Have your way in our hearts, Lord. Just begin to move in a mighty way. Anoint the worship. Receive our worship, Lord. In Jesus' name I ask it. We glorify you and praise you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Will you give the Lord a clap offering of praise as we begin worship?
magnificent God who created the world around us and all the creation. Everything is in an order and in place. The planets are in orbit and we're spinning on an axis that scientists can't explain. All they know is that we got started and they don't ever know when it will stop. God who created the, the incredible, what does he want from us? I got to tell you, I mean, I don't think I could pay that bill, you know. I don't think I could come up with what I could with my own strength and my own ability. I ain't got enough of it in my checking account. I don't have enough there. I could, I'd never have enough to pay him and give him what he's done to me and for me. You know what he wants from me? Just what that song says. He just wants me to exalt him. I mean, really, he just wants us to exalt him. Sure, we go all in and we give our life to Christ, but he desires us to exalt his name. We don't have an egotistical God. We don't have a God that's just so self-centered it's all that. I got to tell you, if anybody should be self-centered, it should be God. There's none who sit beside him. There's none that is great as he is. And when he looks at you and I, he longs to hear from our lips, I exalt you, Lord. He longs to look at us during our everyday routines. And we live when we're tempted, we do not fall prey to temptation, and we're obedient to him, and he hears for our, our obedience daily, I exalt you. Our 15 minutes of prayer and reading our Bible, the Lord looks down and he hears something come out of us, I exalt you, I exalt you. You see what I mean? Because worship is not, worship is not in the confines of, of a lyrics of a song nor the music. Worship is our life, our lifestyle. Worship is what we've been created to do. How we live, what we do, how we operate, what we say, how our very beings are created to worship God. How many here love Jesus? I mean, really, come on now. Don't, praise you, Lord. don't play with me. How many here really love Jesus? Why don't we exalt him for a moment? We take time for that. We take time for everything else. We take time to watch a playoff game in football. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing simple, but we take time for that stuff. Don't you think even more greater if we take time to just worship him, glorify him? Let the Holy Spirit strengthen you as you begin to magnify the Lord and glorify him and exalt him. Sing that a little bit more, would you know? Joshua chapter 3. 
Joshua chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version Bible, or maybe it's the Old New International Version Bible. You know, translations change a little bit with time, but I've got one and I'm holding on to it, so that's what I'm going to use. But I think we're going to get the message no matter what translation you're going to read out of because the truth is there. Let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, touch our hearts and our minds now, Lord, that we receive your word. That each and every one of us, Lord, in this room will receive instruction from you by the Holy Spirit. Through the context of your word, let faith rise up in our hearts right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. The people of Israel's 40 years of wandering in the desert, in the desert experience is up. It's over. They're ready to cross over into the promised land. At this point, Moses is dead, and Joshua, the assistant, is in charge. It's his job to get them ready to meet with God. This is where we pick up in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 to begin with. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shidon, and went to the Jordan, where they camped before the crossing the river. After three days, the officers went and throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. Let's pause there. You know what the Ark of the Covenant is? The Ark of the Covenant is that Ark is that sacred chest where the ancient Hebrews' uh, tablets of the Ten Commandments were in that chest. A bowl of manna was in that chest. Aaron's rod that budded was in that chest. It was all some symbolic of miracles that God had given to the people of God. Listen, when you and someone said the presence of the Lord, yes, it's symbolic of God's presence. Wherever you have God's presence, you have his miracles available. God doesn't go anywhere unless it suddenly becomes miraculous. You know, because when God shows up, it no longer is in the box of humanity where humanity boxes up everything and, and puts God in the box. Well, let me tell you, if you've been trying to put God in your box, he won't fit. He won't fit in your box. He's beyond understanding and he's beyond total explanation. He's God. He's beyond the, He's the beginning and the end and everything in the middle and in between. He's everything. And so you can't put God in a box. But the children of Israel, they could put certain articles in that box. And God had issued them the orders of creating that, that Ark of the Covenant, where that there was the mercy seat at the top of that chest, and there was overlaid with gold. It was symbolic of the presence of God. For God's presence is great and it's holy. And so I'm so glad, listen, I'm glad God makes himself accessible. Even though there were extreme limitations in the Old Testament, you can still see God making himself accessible to his people. Then in the extreme sense, he became, came here in person through Jesus Christ. And now we, he made himself very personable in our life. He become our personal savior. He works in our situations and issues of our life. And as the old hymn goes, and he walks with me and he talks of me. And he tells me I am his own. And so I'm not going to go on the rest of the song, but he does remind us that he's present. So the Ark of the Covenant, the golden chest, the priest would bear up and carry as the children of Israel would travel. They've wandered for 40 years, and now they're at the, at the place where they had longed for and wanted to be, and God was about ready to do something with them. Isn't that funny how we pray we always want God to do something for us and to us and at us, but God generally works through us. He says, i got a journey for you, and I want you to join in with me. I don't want you just to, I'm just not going to, I'm not the genie that lays things, everything in your lap. You don't have a God like that. God will not just lay something in your lap. 
He would say, you get up and walk with me, and I'll work in your life, and I'll show you things that you'd only dreamed of if you just walk with me. Yeah. All right, well, I went halfway, partway, three-quarter way into the sermon. I got to back up and let's go back to Scripture. So we know what the Ark of the Covenant is. Verse 3 says, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests who are Levites, Carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. The Ark of the Covenant does represent the presence of God. In other words, we are to follow God. When God moves, we should move. Joshua 3 and 4 states, Then you will not know, then you will not know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. I love that verse of scripture. I mean, this, this is the story of my life and the story of your life. This is the story of faith. Could it be today that God is calling you and I to a place where we've never been before? Wow. Amen. A call to faith being all in can be intimidating. It can be challenging. It can, guess it, it can even be scary to be all in, be willing to dive in and to go in. We have to learn to listen to God's voice. We have to be willing to step out in faith and follow him. But there's one thing I do know I will tell you today. God calls us to places that we have never been so that we can learn what it means to trust in him. God's going to take you place you've never been. Maybe you're in that place now and you've never been here before and you don't know what you're going to do. God puts you in that place because he wants you to trust in him. He wants to move us from the comfortable places into the uncomfortable places. He wants to take us to places so we can experience him and who he is. When we trust in him the way that we are to go, then the way that we should go, we trust in him will suddenly become clear to us. He'll show us as we go. He shows, you know, we, we expect God to be the, our, our convenient GPS. Will tell us the time of our arrival, the destination, and give us two or three different ways to get there before we finally decide which way we want to go. No, God says, I'm getting up. Are you going to get up? I'm going to move. Are you going to move? Are you going to follow my presence? Yeah. I'm not even going to tell you where I'm taking this ark. You just follow this ark. You just follow the presence of God, and God will lead you all the way. That's what faith is all about, brother and sister. It's not about knowing in advance where you're going to go and what's going to happen and have all your ducks in a row, and it's all planned out, and the GPS is printed out. You can go to MapQuest, and there it is. You're going. You know you're going where you're going. You even know where the restaurants are, where you're going to stop, or where you're going to make pit stops, and where the restrooms are going to be, because you want this journey to be convenient. God says, I don't want it to be convenient. I want it to be filled with trust and faith and know that where I lead you, if you follow me, you'll see the things that I'm able to do in your life. Yeah, Christianity is not for wimps. It's not for sissies. It's not easy. It's a warfare out there. But as long as we God can clear you, there's the presence of God. We just follow him. How do you think you got as far as you did already? You think you really did it on your own? You think you really? Well, I decided I think I'll finally get saved. No, God got a hold of you and shook you and said, you need me. I'm so glad the Lord shook me. I'm so glad God got my attention. And I found out that as we follow him, we'll learn what it means to trust him and to believe in him. When we trust him, the way that we will go will become clear as we move ahead. Joshua 3 and 4 says, Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But since the distance is about a thousand yards between you and the ark, do not go near it. In other words, it's saying this, do not get ahead of my presence. Do not take my presence for granted. For my presence is holy. 
and my way is holy. And there's something required of you to be all in. But when you're all in and you follow me, you'll see me at a distance. You know what I like about that verse? Is that I, if I know that God's presence is a half a mile down the way, that's really how far it was, a half a mile down the way from where I'm at, I know already I'm going to make it that half a mile. Because the Lord has already been there and the Lord has already passed through. And all I have to do is follow him one half a mile at a time and know that he's going to take care of me. Somebody has got to be feeling this. You don't know how, but you do know who, and you know that God will take care of you. Hallelujah. Yeah, you will make it go see. The presence of God has already been ahead of you since you're following God. He's already walked the path. When I was a little boy, you know, back in the old days and where uh, people of another generation start to talk about back in the day, you know. We went to school, even if there was six feet of snow, we went to school. I lived in the city, and so it was in Louisville, and so there were six kids in my family, and I was the second, the youngest. My sister was too young to go to school, so I was the youngest and the smallest. And there was literally, I think we had almost a foot of snow outside and somehow or another those plows were very, very proficient. They cleared the roads and saw that the roads and we had school anyway. And since I didn't ride the bus, I walked to school. Well, I was going to school no matter what. I was all decked out and arrayed with all the, the layers. My mother would layer me in love. At the time she finished layering me with scarves and sweaters and coats, I couldn't even bend my arm. Because back then, in those days, a coat was a coat. You know, it's like buying a brand new car cart. You know, you can't move your arms in it, you know. Everybody wants it to be pre-warm, pre-washed and everything so you can move around. I don't see how some of you guys work in that stuff. So you wouldn't, I don't see how you even walk in that. It's like a board, you know. Like, I'm going to go put on my card heart board jacket and board pants so I can walk out there and try and do something. Well, but here I was, I'm just joking, okay, buy the card heart, pretty cool actually, card hearts. And so, but I'm all bundled up and I can't keep up with my brothers and sisters, they're bigger than me, they're taller than me, they're moving forward. And here I am, I'm, I'm supposed to stay with the pack. As a matter of fact, there was a there was a law and a, a decree by by the queen of the house called my mother that told my brothers and sisters, you keep an eye on Ronnie. So he, you know, walk with you and go with you. And so my oldest brother Curtis said something I'll never forget. He said, Ronnie, I was trying to keep up. I couldn't keep up. Scoot, 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 scoot. It was just, just trying to keep up, and they're just moving further, further, further away. And in my desperation, I keep scooting harder, but I'm still not moving any faster. So finally, Curtis says something. He said, Ronnie, turn around. I said, Ronnie, he said, you just step in the steps I've already made in my footsteps, and then you can move faster in the snow. And I learned that, that it, it worked. It really worked. I could move faster and keep up because I was stepping into his steps that he'd already made. What do you think Jesus has done? What do you think God has done with his presence? Uh, he's made a step ahead of you so that you can keep up and keep going. I'm telling you, uh, we've been destined, we've been decreed, uh, we've been marked with God's favor and his blessing and salvation. All oh, those whom the Lord saves, he's not going to leave them behind uh, in the snow. God's going to make a way when there doesn't seem to be a way. He'll make the steps and the motion so we can keep up and we're going to make it. There's a word for somebody today and the word is you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Because Jesus Christ is made for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's not my notes, but that's, that's in my life. Thank God for life. He calls us in places we've never been so that we can learn what it means to trust in him. He said there, he said, didn't you know which way to go, verse 3, or verse 4, since you have never been this way before, but keep a distance about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Respect. Follow behind it. Follow the presence of God. Of course, you know you couldn't go near it because Jesus hadn't come yet. But when Jesus came, 
the most holy place became accessible to the children of God. We don't have to worry about going in the most holy place and being around the most holy things because Jesus Christ has made us holy. Joshua 3 and 5 says, Joshua told the people, he said, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. What do you think? I, I, I felt the seriousness thing about all in is because let me tell you, I want to tell you, get, go all in. Get all in because the Lord's about ready to do amazing things. Tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. God's going to do something great in your life. Uh, I just feel sorry for those who just kind of kind of just hang out a little bit with Christianity and get to a, a, a religion rather than a relationship. I feel sorry for those who are sitting in church right now and suffering through a, a, some dead cold service. Listen, I tell you what, I wouldn't go to church. If it was dead and dry and I could sit there and go to sleep. Uh, I want you to know God has commissioned me as a preacher to make sure you don't go to sleep. <laughs> Why else do you think I've got this cordless mic? Why else do you think I scream and holler and sweat like I'm going to blow up? And the, I'm doing it for one expressed reason. There is the presence of God. That is more valuable than anything. There's a God who's not going to let you down. And not going to let you fall back. There's a God who is truly alive. There's a Holy Spirit that is a fire. And a wind. And a water that will move and touch our very lives. There's a God that doesn't want us to survive. But he wants us to thrive in him. Because of his presence. Consecrate yourself. Get all in because God's about ready to do something amazing in your life. How many here are folks who have experienced the amazing? Raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. We can help others to know, hey, look what God done for me. He doesn't love me more than what he loves you. Yeah. And he'll intervene. If you'll just consecrate yourself and get all in, then you'll see amazing things with, with God. Amazing things among you. I believe that every one of us can go all in with God, embracing three principles that's in this passage of Scripture. You can go all in. Number one is prepare yourself. Sometimes God has to work on you before he works on a solution. So that's God working on you because he's wanting to work out your solution. He gets at us first. Why? Because he cares about us more than the solution. Yeah. So he tells you, consecrate yourself tomorrow. I'll do amazing things. But first of all, consecrate yourself. Wow. Yeah. Quit doing the things that you're doing now that you said yesterday you'd never do. Quit playing with things and see how close you can get to the edge without falling off. But make sure that you get so far inland that you don't even reach the edge. That you possibly could fall off. Quit playing games and gambling with an eternal relationship with God. Get all in with Him and consecrate yourself. In other words, get rid of anything in your life that may offend the heart of God. That's consecration. You get rid of it. It doesn't belong. If you don't know what's wrong with you, ask your spouse. He or she will tell you. <laughs> I wouldn't say they're Holy Ghost Junior, but I'll tell you what, they're the closest thing. I'll tell you what, my wife knows me more than my mama ever knew me. My mama knew the angel. My wife discovered the devil. <laughs> and she cast the devil out. You know, because you know what I'm saying. I'm being a little bit facetious here. Funny, but the truth is, is that she knows all my weaknesses and the, the hang-ups and my issues and all that. You know that, all that human stuff. But she loves me just the same. God loves you just the same. But he says, I don't want you to stay where you're at. I don't want you to keep being the way you are. I want you to consecrate yourself and consecrate yourself because I want to do amazing things tomorrow. You know what? Because many times God will work on us before he'll prepare us before he takes care of our solution, what we need. Joshua 3 and 5 said, Joshua 
told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do amazing things among you. In other words, get ready. Prepare yourselves for what God has in store. God has already prepared the way. Now he's preparing you and I. Joshua told the children of Israel, consecrate yourselves. Consecrate means to give entirely, to dedicate yourself. It means going all in. Practically speaking, I see consecration literally is that you're just removing anything in your life that may, that may offend the heart of God. Uh, the heart of God. And people immediately go to the church and blame the church. Uh, the church, you tell me I can't do this. The church, church people are going to get offended and whatever. What really matters is what is the Lord thinking about the situation and with you? What does God have to say about it? How does he feel about it? If it's hurting his heart, then get rid of it. And let me tell you what hurts his heart. Anything's going to hurt you. Because he loves you so much. Anything's going to tear your life apart. Whether it be adultery, drugs, alcohol, things that make you get out of control. That hurts the heart of God because it's hurting you. For know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God loves you that much and he decided, he said, listen, I'm not going to just hover around you like in creation with the spirit. I'm going to come inside of you and my spirit's going to dwell inside of you because I love you that much. Samson, when he played around and played games, he lost the presence of God and the spirit of God didn't even know when it left him. When he shook himself, he so desired once again for that strength to be thriving in his life, his spiritual strength to overcome the enemy. And there he found himself that God's spirit had departed from him because he had drifted so far and took advantage of every situation that now he shook himself and wondered, where are you, God? Well, don't you think the same thing happens with us personally? We're going to shake ourselves. We're ready to take down devils and demons and the enemy and claim everything in the name of Jesus, shake ourselves, and where's God? Well, consecrate yourself. God says, ah, I plan on doing amazing things tomorrow. Consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourself. Get the joke out of your life. That comes from the idea of consecration. Is there anything in your life that offends the heart of the Lord? Joshua was saying, I want you to get serious. Tell the people, I want you, in essence, I want you to get serious. I want you to prepare yourself. God's going to show up and do amazing things among you. So many times we say we want God to move in our lives, but our actions say otherwise. My question is, are you contacting other people to pray about your problem, but your actions is not showing any way that you're wanting to move toward God? Or are you just giving it to someone on Facebook saying, you pray about it? You, I pick on Facebook. I better stop it. But I pick on I'm on it. You know, I say, hey, I, I'll call me a hypocrite if you want, but you know, I'm on it to a certain degree. But quit putting it on someone else. Consecrate yourself. Let our actions say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Not contradicted. God wants to move, but he'll never, but if we never prepare ourselves, it's funny how that we want God to move, but we never prepare ourselves for the move of God. We just, you know, hey, hey God, you're going to move, right? You're going to do something right, God, right, right? Without me having to do anything, without me being responsible, I'm going to tell you, the devil sure is handing out some crazy games. And some of the people of God are buying into something much less because they're, they're not preparing their hearts for God. I'm not talking about some heavy legalistic thing. I just mean, you make up your mind, I'm going to go and sin no more. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to play with the things of the world and Satan. I'm not going to allow these things in my life anymore. If you gotta, if you gotta pour it out in the sink when you get home from church today, do it. You gotta pour the pills down the toilet and flush it. Do it. Just get rid of the stuff. Make up your mind and say, "This is the day. This is the moment. I consecrate myself to God." You know what happened? God is going to do amazing yeah. things tomorrow in your life. Prepare your heart. 
for it. Prepare your heart for it. Yeah, yeah. It's not that the fire of the Lord's coming is going to consume you. No, God, the Bible says, tomorrow God's going to do amazing things in your life. When you think about the words amazing things, what what does that look like maybe to you? What do you think, what do you need God to do in your life? I believe that God wants to move into our lives and to do great things. In fact, his dream for our life and even for our church here is that so much more bigger than what we even imagine. When I look at the people of God, I look up so many times in the congregation I see Oh, I just look at you and say, what great, great, great potential you have in the Lord. And God wants to use you and God wants to move in your life. You have great potential with God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ, through him, that's being in him. And I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the old saying is, there's an old saying that says, potential is not worth a dime unless you do something with it. You got potential, it's not worth a dime unless you do something with it. God's calling us to be all in so he can do great things in our lives. I believe that everyone in this room has great potential, including myself. So what are we doing? It's time to get ready. God wants to dedicate, wants us to dedicate ourselves to his purposes. I believe God is wanting to do amazing things, but he's looking for a people who are spiritually prepared. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm so glad it's not like the brass ring you can't really reach on the merry-go-round. You, know? yeah, right. you can't reach, you can't reach, you can't go. No, no, God doesn't. He doesn't dangle carrots in front of us and, and brass rings. God gives promises to us. Yeah. Joshua said, get ready for God is going to do something great. But the children of Israel had to do something. They had to step out in faith. They, they had to face their fears. And they had to take action. Number two, in this blessing of God, not only do we prepare, but we got to take a step. God will use your action to turn opportunity into reality. Your action turns opportunity into reality. Opportunity doesn't occur or doesn't become a reality until you step out and you take that opportunity. You take action. Be willing to step out into new areas. It takes more than just preparation. Ultimately, it takes putting, on, putting one foot in front of the other and taking the first step. But there's a problem. There's a barrier. And it's called the Jordan River. Here they are. Promised land over there, and there's that Jordan River, which was overrun in its banks because it's the rains before the harvest and it was flooded even wider than what it normally is. And the promised land was on the other side of the Jordan River. And here were two million people that needed to cross over that river. They didn't have a bridge, they didn't have a ferry, they had no way of making it across. God gave the people a role to play in amazing things that he's promised. He said to them, he said, pick up the Ark of the Covenant. Joshua 6 and 8, 3, verse 6 and through 8 says, Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they looked, looked that, so they took it up and went ahead of them. And the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant, and when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Symbolically, picking up the Ark is like picking up the promises and the presence and the commands of God. And placing those things, promises and commands on your shoulders, knowing that God is going with you. That's faith. It's about trusting God. It's about taking action. It's about getting your feet wet. Go stand in the river. Now, if they were waiting on yesterday and yesteryear and 40 years ago, 
They would say, well, we only stepped on dry land when God parted the Red Sea. And so our father said that, but no, no, he gave them instruction, go and get your feet wet. Today is the day to say for us, yes, God, and to say I'm all in. Today's the day that you get your feet wet. Amen. The priest carried the ark into the river. They stepped into the water and they trusted God for a miracle. So now we have it. We've consecrated or prepared ourselves. We've made a move and done what we can do. Now it's time to what? Trust God. Well, this is where we this is where we sort of stall a little bit, trusting in God. We prepared ourselves, we picked up the ark, we stand, we're standing in the water, like you said, Lord. As soon as the priest took those first steps into the Jordan River, instantly the flow of the water stops. But I, I want you to look at what happened when the children of Israel stepped into the Jordan River. Verses 15, 16. Now the Jordan is at the flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from the upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarephan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, was completely cut off, so the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Now, what you need to do when you read this text, you need to carefully look at it, and you need to know a little bit of geography and just a little, little simple physics here. The town of Adam or Adam is about 20 miles upstream from where the priests are standing. The water in the Jordan River is probably flowing at an average of five miles per hour. This is like a math word problem. How many of you love math word problems? Math is hard. Look at that. Water leaves Adam traveling south at five miles per hour. How long before the water reaches the priest 20 miles downstream? Get the picture? The instant the priest's feet touch the water, God performs a miracle. But the miracle is 20 miles upstream. To their eyes, as they're standing there, nothing's happening. In fact, it's going to be hours before there's any evidence that God is at work. These guys step out in faith but they did not see any visible change. They got to be thinking, Joshua, this just isn't working here. We're standing here and nothing's happening. That waiting, waiting moment, you know, when you can hear a pin drop. You know, when you hear the clicking of the clock on the wall when it's all silent and everybody's looking and nothing is happening. Some of you are in that place in your life right now. But you see, because you have decided to be all in and you have consecrated yourself before the Lord and you listen to step out and believe in God no matter what. The miracle, the moment you stepped into that river, the miracle has been performed and now you're waiting for it to happen up to you, coming downstream 20 miles away, but it's coming your way, just believe in God, and hold on, and know that God's going to do amazing things in your life, have faith and trust in God. Oh, I must have felt when they finally started feeling the water, and then, oh, 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 hey Joshua, stop, say something, buddy. Hey, 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 it's backing up, backing up, backing up, and then under their feet is sand and dry land. So the two million people could cross. That's the two million people. That's a whole lot of people. Well, they backed up for half a mile or more so they could finally cross the river. But you see, you've got to prepare. You've got to step out or step in, and you've got to trust God for God to do something. That's faith. 
That's faith in operation. And that's what happens to those who are all in. I may be standing there and maybe, maybe, maybe there was a worship leader named Noah that was in the game. He starts singing the song and then the guy gets afraid. Even if I don't see it, he's working. Even if I don't see it, he's working. You know, worship leader probably got really excited. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we don't see it, but it's working. God's working behind the scenes. God's not on vacation. God hasn't given up on you. He is faithful to his word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall, well, shall never pass away. You can trust in God's word and the word of God. Believe in him, but you just may have to wait for it to catch up with you. But keep on believing because it's on its way. Hallelujah. situation, situation. Believe in God. You pray. You have decided to be all in and consecrate yourself, prepare yourself for God to not ready to do something amazing. Then you step out by faith and knowing, though I don't see anything happening, God has heard my prayer and have faith in Him. I told you Christianity is not for wimps. It's not for sissies. Our God is able. And more than that, our God is willing. He is willing to do what we need. I got any witnesses in the house that can say, Pastor Ron, I know what you're talking about. I had to have my feet in the water for a long time before I finally started seeing the water recede and the answer of God move in. Some of you prayed for prayer requests that took over a year before you finally look at you now. Look what's happened now. If God has received the waters and you believe in God, and look at where you're at right now. God has answered your prayer. It didn't happen in a minute. It didn't happen in an hour. It didn't even happen in days or weeks or months. And maybe even took a year. But look at where you're at now and look and see how the miracle of God caught up with you. Turn to your neighbor and say, no, God is an on-time God. Somebody say, yes, he is. He is an on-time God. They crossed over, and what did they see? Jericho. A lot of people, they, won't, they don't want the miracle because they know they're going to face the enemy, too. But don't you know, if God gives you the miracle, God gives you the victory. What do you think they thought about when they're going to face Jericho? Wow, man, we just crossed the river back here, and God made the way. If he do it for that, and he'll do it for that, he'll do it for something else. Yeah. I can trust in my God. That's why they marched around the city like they did while they were being mocked. But they believed and trusted in God and heard what Joshua said. Believe in God. You believe in God. And say out loud, Satan, you're a liar. Satan, you're a liar. See, some of you don't talk that way because I don't think you really believe there's a Satan, but there is. And you have the authority through the name of Jesus Christ to rebuke him. Amen. And say, Satan, you're a liar. The greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah, look at you. Uh, somebody said, man, God did something amazing happen to the Linda Cotley, something amazing, something amazing happened to Rick Causey, something amazing happened to Calvin Preston. Look at him now! Would you stand with me? Where's your team? You just come on. Always early. I, I didn't put an alarm on my iPad, let me know when you're saying it's coming. 
<laughs> Isn't it so funny? We're just so alert with that, believing that, that that snow's going to come. <laughs> 